The other day we did a video on making a butcher tool. It's a bottom butcher, sits in the anvil in the hardy hole, and is a one-sided thing. And we talked about using that to forge the tenons for our, our window grill project. And this is a pretty good way to go. It's a very traditional way to do it with a single bottom butcher. You work all the way around the bar and it gets the job done. But if you noticed at the end of that video, I was having a little trouble aligning it because I didn't do a very good layout job. Now doing the layout's not a problem. When we do the grill, we'll do a better layout and we'll make sure it gets done right. But in the comments, one of you troublemakers has to throw out the suggestion of what about a spring butcher? That is genius. It is such a simple idea. I can't believe I didn't think of it. Well, I'm not a genius. That's why I didn't think about it. The guy that suggested it is the genius. So what would a spring butcher be? What does that mean? We haven't really talked much about spring tools yet. So I've got some spring tools here. And a lot of these are power hammer tools because I don't use a lot of spring tools at the anvil. But they're absolutely useful at the anvil. This is a big set of spring fullers for use under the power hammer. And I've got a hardy socket on the side of my hammer so I don't have to hold on to this. This is a very simple spring fuller. And we'll make one of these today just for use at the anvil or by hand. And we'll discuss what some of the problems with making tools like this are if you don't have an arc welder. Most of these tools have some arc welding in them. This one does not, but it also doesn't have a way to set it in the anvil. The hardy shank on this spring fuller is arc welded on. So to make simple tools like this, often an arc welder is a real benefit. But we're going to explore some methods to do these that don't require the arc welder. And you can make spring fullers in any size you want. It just really doesn't matter. Although much smaller, this is 5 16 Much smaller than this is really a pretty wimpy little thing. And this one won't hold up for long. Most of these are mild steel. They aren't going to last forever. Uh, the spring fullers are kind of sacrificial, but they only take a few minutes to make. Spring swedges, these typically have a tool steel head, 40, or a, an alloy steel. 4140 is really good for the spring swedges. And they are, again, a power hammer tool in this version. You could make this into a version for use at the anvil. And that's just another, the same, same thing. And it's got two holes for two stages of the process. So that's just kind of a look at what a spring tool is, a spring swedge, a spring fuller. And in this case, we're going to make a top and bottom butcher tool that has a spring handle on it. And we're going to do that out of a single piece with no forge welds and no arc welds. And I've never done it because the thought didn't occur to me. So we're going to see how that works. I've got an idea. We're going to start with about two feet of half by one and a quarter inch mild steel bar stock. We're just going to make this out of mild steel. It won't last forever, but it'll last way longer than it takes to do our window grill project. So we're going to see if my idea for making this tool works, and if it doesn't, then you get to learn right along with me what I did wrong, and I'll make suggestions on what I would do this the next time. The idea behind a spring tool is to have top and bottom tools that are hands-free. You don't have to hold on to something, hold on to the stock, hold on to the hammer, don't have to have a striker or a treadle hammer or a power hammer. You can do this at the anvil. So our butcher will be the bottom butcher and a top butcher connected by a spring. And I've seen old tools done this way, but they looked very much like regular top and bottom tools that the smith had added the spring to. And I, the oldest ones would have had to have been either punched and a tenon spring put through or something wrapped around somehow. I haven't examined them close enough to know exactly how they did that. I wish I had an old one to, to see and compare. But they sometimes are also hinged back here. And I suppose you could set up some sort of a, a bottom plate that your hardy tool fit into and had a hinge. And maybe you could have different ways of, you know, one system 
that held different tools. I don't know, just a, a random thought I just had at that very moment. So we're going to start with the hardy shank on our spring butcher, just like I always start with the hardy shank, and I'll kind of explain where I'm going. I'm not sure if I can describe this well enough without showing you, so we'll show you how what I'm doing as we do it. So we're starting off with inch and a quarter by half inch bar. The half inch is what I want for the project. The inch and a quarter I chose because it fits in my hardy hole. If you've got a one inch hardy hole, half by one would be perfect for this project. First thing I want to do is bend this over 180 degrees. For a one inch hardy hole out of one inch wide material, you'll need to make that tight. For my inch and a quarter hardy hole, I get to leave a little space in there. So that makes our hardy shank. Now I'm going to bend it over 90 degrees. Yep, I don't want to do that yet. So there's our, there's our hardy shank and the part that will become the spring. And I want to put a twist in this part, and I'll show you why here. I want to put a 90 degree twist kind of down close to the bottom here. And then I'm going to bend that over. Of course, my twist untwisted a little bit. I think I can fix that. So this part now becomes our bottom butcher. And I can start beveling that right now. So if this is our bottom butcher, this section becomes our spring, and when you get all the way to this end, this becomes our top butcher. I'm going to make sure this sits down nice and tight so the hardy hole is good and snug. But now we're ready to form the spring part. Now I think the ideal spring for a spring tool is somewhere between quarter by one, or excuse me, quarter by three quarter, which is what this spring is, and quarter by one and a quarter, depending on how big the tool is. Really big tools probably need more, but I think I'm going to try and draw this section out right through here to about quarter by one or a little bit less. No thinner than a quarter, but it can be uh, much thinner than an inch. So this becomes the fun part. Drawing this down. Just creating a transition at the edge of the anvil. Instead of going to the horn, I'm going to use this big four pound diagonal peen hammer, which gives me the benefit of being at the horn from the round and drawing out nature, but it keeps me over the face of the anvil where the anvil is way more solid. The horn can tend to bounce a little bit. But the horn is a good option if you don't have a monster hammer. We 
we're just going to keep working that until it's what we want. This section right up here is what I want. So I've got a whole inch and a half of it. We've got another 10 or 15 inches to go. And I am not going to make you watch this. So we now have a much longer spring section here. We've got a section set aside for our top butcher. Now this is way more drawing out than I anticipated. And I'm not going to lie to you, I took this to the power hammer because I wasn't going to spend an hour or two hours drawing this out. You certainly could though. If this is the way you want to do, do it, you can certainly spend that time drawing it out. Next thing I want to do is put a twist in this end so that that's in the same plane as the bottom side of the butcher. And for that we'll go to the vise. And I left a little heavier section here but reduced it in width just for a place to put this twist. I think it'll go just a little bit easier. You know, we'll take that to the anvil and clean that up and start putting the bevel for the butcher on there. And you want to make sure you get the, the bevels on the same sides. These are mirror images of each other. And we'll finish this up with a file or a grinder. So that's it for the uh, forging until I go and file this. We have our bevel started on this side. This is going to loop around and make the spring. And that will match the bevel that I forged on this other side. So I'm going to let that cool and I'm going to do those. Do a little bit of grinding and we'll bend it. So here's the nearly finished forging. I've ground the bevels on here just to make that a little bit easier. You've seen me grind before. You don't need to see me grind. So the next trick is to bend this. So we'll get this center section hot, put it back in the hardy hole, and bend that over and make these ends line up. It's nice to have a bigger loop, something like this, when you do this. Uh, that makes it a little bit springier, opens and closes better, keeps the mild steel spring from collapsing. But it's important to have it flat on the bottom because if some reason you're using it this way, you can't have that loop hanging down below the edge of the anvil. So I'm just going to put that in the anvil. And bend this around kind of by hand and by eye. Straighten things out as I go. And then I'm going to reheat this section and I'm going to drop this down to forward in that, that top ring and that should help pull this end in. If it doesn't, we'll line this all up afterwards. For this, a uh, hunk of pipe welded to a hardy stem is sure handy. Let me see what I'm doing there. That's pretty much all we need to do at this stage. A little bit of tweaking and realigning here. Things bow and get out of alignment. That's essentially the finished tool. So I've got that all lined up and 
the spring set and it looks like it's going to be a functional tool so let's try it out and see what we get. A lot of spring tools can be kind of bouncy like that. Not a big deal. You just have to learn to deal with it. Now this does help us line up our top and bottom butchers. And by working around the corner it helps line up the sides until they become the tops of the bottoms. So I'm going to take another heat. Sometimes you need a way to pry these open when you're using spring tools because they want to be closed. Of course, if you don't let the material pop out of there, that's not such a big deal. This is definitely going to be easier to get the line up than the bottom butcher only. So I like that aspect. So it's absolutely a functional butcher, leaving a nice clean shoulder. Before we finish taking a look at the spring butcher, I said we would also do a spring swedge, or excuse me, a spring fuller. And we're going to just start with a piece of half inch round bar. This is 40 inches long. It may not be long enough, but we'll find out. And I'm going to start exactly the same way. Make a 90 degree bend. For a one inch square hardy hole, this needs to be tight. For my inch and a quarter hardy hole, it doesn't need to be very tight. So I'm going to let it spring apart. Now I want to take this bend and bend it back again so that I have essentially a square bar. Now I've cooled the rest of that bar off so I can get a hold of it. Real easy to start the bend right here in the hardy hole where it's going to go anyways. It's a little problematic keeping what is now four round bars corralled, but it can be done. And that'll fit nicely in the hardy hole. This will fit better in a smaller hardy hole, but it'll work in mine. And I can always spread these apart a little bit if I need it to fit better. So just like in the spring butcher, I'm going to bend one out for the spring, and bend one out for the, the bottom of the fuller. I can tell already I did not leave enough material here. I should have, or did not prepare enough material. By spreading this out, that's going to fit my hardy hole much better. This isn't a style I make very often. So this will be the, the part that sits on the anvil, and this will be the spring part. And this is where I didn't leave enough material. I'm going to have a real tight loop here, and it's not going to be as springy as I would like. come back about here to start my bend in hopes that it has enough material here. I'm going to do better than I thought. I'm going to back bend it right here so that when I bring this around I 
I can end up with a fairly reasonable spring and arm there. Now I think this should have extended way further back there, but I still didn't match my other side. But nevertheless, that is a simple way to achieve a spring fuller with a hardy shank. I think I would have started with at least another 10 inches of material. Now I'm going to need to spread this, which is easily done with a uh, chisel driv driven down in there to, to spread that. So let's just go ahead and do that. I happen to have a big chisel right here. So that fits a little bit better. Well, there are two forms of spring tools for use at the anvil that have a hardy shank that is made out of the same material as a tool, one-piece tools. There's a little bit of flailing, a little trouble with these. One, I've never made one this way. This was something I just thought of the other night to do the flat bar bent and try to get a, a butcher type tool out of it. I've done that when we did our, our hardies and made this hardy. And in both cases, I'm not real thrilled with it. I don't like the way it looks. It's a functional tool. It'll get the job done. But it's not my taste. Doesn't mean it won't work. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. This style of spring fuller is really quite simple. This was a lot faster than making this. And it's probably worth the time to do it if you don't have a way to weld a square shank. While I don't like arc welding, as part of the projects I do, the things that I put out for customers, because I'm not a welder, I'm not really opposed to tools that are welded. Having said that, tools that are 100% hand forged appeal to me a lot more, even though these aren't them. Now let me explain that a little bit. So what are my thoughts on these tools? These, these were both made out of mild steel, probably not three or four dollars worth of steel between the two tools so they're very cheap, very inexpensive to make. Mild steel is easier to forge than tool steel is. But this tool without a power hammer is probably going to take you three or four hours if not a full day to forge out. Don't go swinging a four, six, eight pound hammer with one hand if you're not used to it just to try and make this go faster. You're going to end up paying for it in the long run. The mild steel is not going to hold its shape very well. The top is going to start to mushroom out very quickly. These edges are going to start to degrade. You can get in there and you can file it or grind it and clean them up. But you're going to spend more time dressing the tool and you're going to need to replace this tool much faster than a tool steel version. Now I would not make this tool out of all tool steel. That's an incredible amount of tool steel to draw out this way. I don't think it needs to be tool steel. These springs, mild steel is the ideal thing for the springs on these. But I think there would be a way to do this with some forge welding or some riveting or some other techniques and we're going to have to look into that. I have not tried to design tools traditionally that do what tools that we take for granted the arc welder do. You know, something like this spring swedge, which is a good tenoning die, has one piece for the spring, a top die, a bottom die, and a hardy stem. So there are four pieces here that have been welded together, and it's been done with the arc welder. This could be done forge welding, it could be done with some riveting or mortise and tenon joints, and I think if we explore those options we can come up with some pretty good ways to make some tools that are very traditionally done, way nicer tools than what I think this is. 
and something you can really be proud of, and it'll be a lot less work in the long run, a lot less physical labor than drawing out that spring. But it will take more skill, and it will be more tool intensive. You will need to have the tongs to do the drop tongs welds, and you will need to have punches and drifts and all those things to make these tools. So we're going to kind of progress that direction, and I think we can do a better job in future versions of these and still avoid the arc welder for those that don't own an arc welder. If I haven't mentioned it, it doesn't really bother me to arc weld tools like this. It's not a finished product. This isn't going out to my customers, and I'm okay with that. Now, these are so handy and so quick to make with an arc welder that I just see no reason not to do it. But I also think we should explore the possibilities and look into making them without. I'm much more proud of tools that I make without the arc welder, so there's that too. Now my plan was for a tinning die or a spring swedge for working on our tenons for the grill project to make a tool very much like this one, except to do it more like we did today. After today's exercise in drawing out this spring, I'm not really interested in doing that much drawing out for a mild steel tool. So I'm going to look at some other way of doing this. We will talk about the fabricated version, so if you do have a welder, you'll be able to do that. And we'll show you how you can do this with drill press and welder. And there's, in fact, you can build this whole tool and never go to the forge. You can all be done as a fabricated tool. But then we will also look at what might another option be to achieve a tool all hand forged, all done traditionally, forge hammer anvil, without the extreme labor requirement of this spring. I think I've sort of uh, beleaguered the point a little bit there and probably talked too much about it. So we're going to call it quits there. I've got a lot of video ideas. Uh, I asked a question a little while ago about videos for the shorter format, what people would like to see, and got lots of ideas for full-length videos and a few ideas for the short videos. So we will continue to do both. I have no intention whatsoever on dropping one format or the other. I just need more ideas for the short format videos. I've got about two months worth of long format videos planned out, so, so we're going to get to more of those. In the meantime, a while back somebody saw the banjo sitting in the background in one of the videos that I did downstairs in the office and said, when your finger's better, I want to hear you play the banjo. So I'm going to indulge that individual just very briefly for a few seconds. This is a good time to tune out the video if you don't like banjo music or if you don't like uh, less than good banjo music. It amazes me sometimes how many blacksmiths there are out there that are really quite accomplished musicians. I'm not one of those that's accomplished, but I do dabble. And it also amazes me how many of them actually play the banjo. I've run into a lot of blacksmiths at conferences and workshops that play the banjo. So here goes just a little bit of something. I don't promise it'll be good, but for the gentleman that asked, here it is. <laughs> of that nonsense. Get out to your shop, make something, stay safe, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one without the banjo.